Hey, uh, today we'll be talking about biases and confounding variables, confounding factors. Um, let me just increase this here. Yeah, so biases are generally um, used in like interdisciplinary approach with an interdisciplinary approach. Um, I think it's a very widely used word or terminology, but a good thing about it is that in every instance of its usage, it always connotes um, um, kind of something similar to what most other fields will will talk about. It's, it talks about um, extremity of of subjectivity. Uh, but in epidemiology and biostatistics, we see it as a systematic error that gave rise to a wrong estimate of the effect of exposure on an outcome. From here on, you'll be seeing uh, the relationship we're talking about exposure and outcome. You get exposed to something, we expect an outcome. You don't get exposed to something, mm, we don't expect an outcome. Uh, but right now, there are about over 50 types of so different types of biases. But I'll be talking about a couple of them in two categories. Information bias and selection bias. On our information bias, we have the observer bias, which talks about the unobserver that knows something about the hypothesis or knows something about the treatment. And therefore, it's biased based on his knowledge of the hypothesis. So he probably favors um, the hypothesis because he thinks it's a solid one, or he favors the uh, treatment because he thinks it's a good treatment. Interviewer bias is when interviewers, um, you know, go ahead and, and tailor or doctor questions to suit the hypothesis they're trying to talk about. In recall bias, um, we see this more in retrospective studies, like case control studies, where you have to go back in time to, you know, remember or ask questions based on, you know, what has happened in the past or past exposure, stuff like that. But generally, we control for recall biases by uh, not asking people questions. Rather, we use medical records and stuff like that. Social desirability, when um, participants tell answer their questions based on what they think is socially desirable. Performance bias, on the other hand, is... Um, they just put up a show for you. They put up a show for you because you know they know what uh, you know you want to see, and they give you what you really want to see based on that. Um, I think there's so what we call the Houghton effect, where people act differently when they are being studied or being observed. Uh, selection bias. We'll talk about it under generalizability, comparability, and lost follow-up, also called that attrition. Generalizability uh, talks about sampling bias. In this case, you notice that people that um, generally volunteer for studies are people that are more health conscious, kind of. You know, because of that case, people more health conscious does not give us a general representation of our population. It's just not very, very generalizable. So that's an issue in our study in epidemiological studies is a bias. Comparability, allocation bias, where um you allocate people specifically to to you know test and then to control and then you because you you know just stop the, the how we can solve this to the generalizability and comparability. For generalizability, just randomizing, just making it very random, the sampling process random. And then uh, for comparability, blinding the study, double blind, uh, I think should help here too. Also, observer uh, observer can also be, um, if you blind the observer completely from hypothesis and everything, you should be able to move forward with that. Um, loss to follow up slash attrition. This one happens in prospective studies where, you know, of course, like cohort studies where you're going in the future and then some people lose their job and move out of town, or move out of state, and you can keep, you know, they can't keep staying in your study. Or some people even die and or some are just not interested in the study anymore with their loss to follow up or attrition. And confounding, 
indicates an alternative explanation for the association between exposure and outcome. I'll give you an example. Um, I, I used to work in, the, in, in an office where uh, we had a nice old lady that had cancer. So cancer is the outcome. She had, she developed cancer. Sad, really sad story. And then a couple of weeks later, they discovered high levels of radon in the building. And then people started telling her, oh, to sue, you know, so she can get, you know, some compensations and stuff. The, the, the thing there is they assumed that radon was high exposure and then she developed the outcome, which is lung cancer, right? The only problem was in her 20s, she smoked. So smoking, in this case, became a confounding variable. So the exposure with considering was the radon in the building giving her lung cancer. But in her 20s, she was a smoker, which becomes a very common. Smoking is the number one cause of lung cancer. Radon is only number two. So it now begs the question where the positioning of confounding and exposure really is, right? So confounding indicates an alternative explanation for the association between exposure and outcome. It creates an alternative, an alternative explanation for it. Yeah, this would have been a very good case in court, but she didn't, she didn't, she didn't, so she didn't go forward with it. Bias versus confounding. When you merge two of them together, you discover that biases create an association that is not true. But confounding describes an association that is true, but potentially misleading. Thank you for um, watching with us today. If this video was helpful to you in any way, shape, or form, I would uh, like you to subscribe and turn on the notification so you can catch the videos as they upload next time until the next installment have a beautiful christmas slash new year season thank you